Hey, welcome to the shop. So today we are doing an overview of stick welding. We're going to start from the beginning. Let's get started by talking about the process in general, how it actually works. Now the overall function of stick welding is pretty simple. You have two pieces of material that you want to join together. And so you melt them using an electrical arc with intense heat right at the point between them. This electrical arc comes from the end of the electrode to your workpiece itself. So electricity flows through there, creates a ton of heat, and it melts those pieces of material together. The welding electrodes actually have a coating on the outside called flux, and that will protect the molten weld pool from the air in the atmosphere. As this electrode heats up, it not only melts the work pieces, melts the electrode itself to add more metal into your weld pool, thus creating a really strong joint with some extra reinforcement on top. There are a few different types of welding machines. There are older transformer type machines, and just like a transformer that you'd see up on a power pole or whatnot, it's basically two coils of wire, and so it takes your household input voltage and current and it changes that to a lower voltage and a higher current that's more suitable to the welding arc. Now because they have those big coils of wire, they tend to be large and heavy, and as material costs have gone up, they've become quite a bit more expensive. Now on the other hand, you have what's called an inverter machine. This is the one I'm using today. They use some advanced electronics to be able to change the voltage and current at a higher frequency, and that makes everything smaller and more compact. And also they generally put out direct current or DC, where a lot of the older transformer machines will only put out alternating current and AC. And it's important to know whether you're dealing with DC or AC when you pick your electrode and what kind of welding rod you use. Let's just run through a few of the other things that you're gonna need as you get started. I'd recommend a good quality welding hood, auto darkening, also welding gloves, just good quality leather, actual welding gloves. Now I'd also recommend getting a welding jacket like this. This is a fire resistant cotton welding jacket. I like these the best because they're a little bit more breathable and comfortable than the leather jacket that I used to wear. If you're gonna be inside or in an enclosed area, it's not a bad idea to consider wearing a respirator if you don't have some way to deal with the fumes that come off of the welding arc because it does produce quite a bit of fume and, and that can be hazardous to breathe in. You can also control the fumes. I have a large fume extractor here in the shop. Just into the last five or six years here welding in my small hobby shop, I've just rigged something up. I have a video about how to make a cheap one to use for less than 100 bucks. I'll list that down in the description as well. You'll also need a chipping hammer and a wire brush. These are useful to remove the slag that's left on the weld after you finish. Let's go ahead and dive in a little deeper on welding electrodes. Each one of them has a four digit code typically, and this has a meaning to it. The first two digits indicate the strength of the weld metal in thousands of pounds per square inch. The next digit indicates what positions it can weld in. A one can weld in all positions. And the last digit indicates the type of flux or type of electrode. Let's talk about the main types. Let's start off by throwing out this one is an aluminum welding rod. I've never gotten a good result out of that. We're talking steel today. And even though there are a bunch of different colors and sizes here, they basically come in three different flavors. Let's walk through each one. So cellulosic electrodes like this are 6010 or 6011. The difference between those is whether it runs AC or DC. 6011 can run on AC, and they both give a deep cutting arc that's good for root passes. Another place that these really shine is welding on rusty or dirty metal if you just want to penetrate in and dig. These are the electrodes for you. But I don't recommend them as a first electrode to learn because it takes a little bit of rod manipulation to keep them from digging in too deep, and that can be a little more challenging than some other electrodes. Next are your rutile electrodes. This is typically a 6013. These are general purpose electrodes. They're not used as much in heavy industry here in the United States, so they are in other countries around the world, and they work just fine, produce a great weld. They can have some problematic issues that I've made other videos about, but in general, not a bad choice for a hobbyist or beginner just looking for one type of electrode to have around. Last up are basic electrodes, and the most common here is a 7018. That's what I usually run, and I love it for a few reasons other than the reason that it was developed. 
One of them is it runs really smoothly, gives a nice smooth bead appearance when you're finished, and the slag coating on it comes off a little easier than others. So for those reasons, I really like it. One of the drawbacks to 7018 is it can be a little more difficult to start your arc or start welding um, on a rod that's already been used, but uh, it's something that we can overcome. I'm gonna be using a 7018 in particular, a 3 seconds of an inch 7018, which runs great on 1 8 inch thick plate, which is what I usually use to fabricate things. Now that we've gone over the difference between different welding electrodes, there's one more thing that we need to cover before we gear up and actually do some welding. And that is the setting on the machine. And I'll be honest with you, it's pretty forgiving in most cases. So I just use this chart that I have up here on the screen. It'll help you to know what thickness of material to run with a particular electrode as well as what uh, amperage to set your machine to. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, I thought welding settings depended on material thickness. And with stick welding, they do a little bit, but they depend a lot more on the type and size of electrode. If you are running a thicker material, you might be a little higher in the range or thinner lower. Also, welding position has quite a bit to do with it. If you're welding in the flat position, which would be sitting flat like this, or horizontal where everything's gonna fall down in place, you'll typically run a bit higher setting than you would if you're welding vertically up a joint like that. All right, now that we've selected an electrode and we have a machine set, we can go ahead and gear up to do some welding. I'm gonna approach this next section on welding technique in a similar way to how I do it in my online courses. There's a lot to learn here. There's a ton to pay attention to, and that's why I created the online courses. In those, I walk through all of the information you need in bite-sized chunks, right? And each one has a practice exercise that you can do to reinforce the small thing that you've learned in a two or three minute video before coming back to the next one. Check them out linked in the description if you think that could be helpful for you. Now we're ready to go ahead and get started with some welding. I've taken my work clamp here, which is connected to the negative side of my machine and connected it to a plate that I'm gonna be welding on. My electrode holder is connected to the positive side. And so electricity will flow through the electrode here and jump across a gap but none of that can get started on its own because see the voltage isn't high enough between this welding electrode and my work clamp to actually start an arc at all. So I have to touch the end of the welding electrode to my workpiece, and that creates a spark which does something called ionizing the air. And when it does that, it changes the resistance across the air such that the welding arc can start. Now in order to do that, there are a couple different techniques. One is you can tap the electrode on here. Another is you can strike like a match, like that. And uh, I honestly do something that's kind of a combination of both. You just need to touch the end of that electrode to your workpiece. It needs to either be some of the bare metal rod rather than this flux coating on the outside, or in some cases they have a little bit of uh, like a graphite paint or something to help start a new electrode on the end. So make sure that it's not coated over with anything and we should be good to go to give this a try. So I'm gonna put my electrode in the holder right here, make sure I have enough slack on my lead and then I'm gonna prop myself up to kind of support and triangulate so I'm not trying to hold it myself and wobble around like that. This is how I like to do it. You can support it on the electrode a little bit if you want to. Now striking an arc looks easy enough when you're watching someone else do it, but let me assure you this can be one of the most frustrating things that you attempt to do in your welding journey. So once you tackle this, you'll be off to the races. You might find that your electrode sticks, and that's probably because either you're putting it down too hard or your amperage setting is just a little bit too low. Most likely you just need a bit of practice. If that happens, just wiggle it to break it loose. Or if it gets stuck really hard like I did right there, you can release the electrode holder and you'll be good to go. Now don't just do this one time. Once you get used to it, try it and practice over and over again. Just strike an arc and weld for a short length and then do it again and again until you're feeling good. Now once you've practiced striking an arc a little bit um, and you're feeling pretty good about it, we can go ahead and move on to our actual welding technique and running a bead. Now there are a lot of things to pay attention to, but really three matter most. 
First of all is your arc length, and that's how far the end of your electrode is from the workpiece. And since your electrode melts off the whole time, you have to be able to feed it in. And this can naturally happen with a motion like that, or you can collapse your hand a little if you need to, or uh, in some cases you can use your pinky and thumb and collapse that in. There are a few different ways to, to prop up, but it's good to support yourself so that you're able to make it through that motion Practice it a little bit before you run. Watch what happens as that arc length gets a little bit long here in this example. The arc comes off not in a straight line or cylinder, but as a cone. So if my arc gets long, everything's gonna stretch out and I'm not gonna have the good control that I want. This is usually gonna be the problem is too long of an arc, it's rarely too short of an arc. Now beyond your arc length, there are two other elements of technique, at least that's what I call them in my courses, um, to pay attention to. One of them is your electrode angle. So notice how I'm pointing a little bit backwards as I run along here. That is because the flux on this outside of the electrode becomes something called slag as it mixes in with the weld pool. That floats to the top, and I don't want that to get mixed in with everything that I'm doing. So if I pushed, then I'd be pushing that slag forward in front of me, could create some problems, where if I drag, it'll push it behind, and it just makes the welding overall a little bit easier. Now that angle is in the direction of travel, so it's often called a travel angle. There's also something called a work angle. Now if I were welding two pieces of metal together in a butt joint like this where the sides butt up against one another. That's a butt joint and it's actually a groove weld. I would want to have my electrode come straight in and out in this direction of work where if I were putting them together in a T-joint and producing a fillet weld on a T-joint, I'd want to come in and out about 45 degrees, something like that. Now the last thing to pay attention to is your movement. There are so many videos out there that focus on different patterns of weaving every which way and, and it's just not necessary for most things. If you are welding in the vertical position, sometimes a little bit of a weave is necessary, some rod manipulation, but in general, just moving straight along when you're welding in a flat or horizontal position, which is the way to start, is gonna work best for you. So that leaves one other aspect of your movement to pay attention to, and that's your travel speed, how fast you're moving. Now the travel speed controls the size of your weld because if you're welding more slowly, it's gonna deposit more material and it will get large. If you're welding quickly, then it won't deposit as much and your weld will be smaller. There's some limits to that though. If you go too fast, what can happen is you'll melt more material out than you're able to fill back in in the time that you have, at least for the amperage setting you're using. So you'll end up with a little recessed area right next to the weld. On the other hand, if you travel too slowly, you risk melting through your material or building up too much heat overall in the material you're welding. Now, if you do keep your arc length, your work and travel angles, and your uh, movement or travel speed all in check, you're gonna have a good result. That's really the recipe to have it come out right. If you just run bead after bead after bead after bead on a flat plate, that's gonna give you those reps to be able to recognize it before you move on to the common weld joints. At that point, you can start working on some of the common weld joints, and there's really four weld joints. If you learn each of these, then you'll be able to put together just about anything you can uh, think of. Those are the T-joint, the butt joint, where the edges butt up against one another, a lap joint where the material overlaps, and an outside corner joint. Once you've covered these, you'll be able to handle most projects. And that's why those are the items that we go over in my online courses, which you can find linked right here. And if you want to learn more about some of the details of any of these processes, I have several videos listed in the description that could be pretty helpful. Thanks a ton for tuning in. We'll see you next time.